when God is dealing with you, God will always separate you and draw you. But when God finishes dealing with you, you are going to draw other people after you. Christianity is a journey. Christianity is not a religion. It is not. It is never a religion. It is a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. There are people who are born again with access to the Father who only know God as a master. There are others who are born again with access to the Father who have gone ahead to know God as a Father. There are others also who have gone ahead to know God as a partner. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We give you all the glory. We honor you this morning. Have your way in our midst. Oh, be God and Lord over this place. Do as you will and as you please in our midst. Let your name be glorified. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We thank God for this morning and we thank God for our lives. Um, today is 28th, 28th May 2017. And uh, we want to thank God for how far He has brought us. And we thank God for taking us throughout the week to the mission field and uh, God was so good to us and we really had a nice time at Agugu in the course of the week. Amen. You know, when we were at Agugu, I said I was going to talk about how we can position ourselves for divine visitation. And I said, if my mind is not changed, and thank God, my mind has changed. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, so um, this morning, uh, the Lord ministered to me, and he asked me to start talking about something. You know, <clears throat> when I had a dream, and when I had a dream, I woke up. At exactly 3.33. This is the second time that has happened to me. Um, the first time was in 2011, September, when um, I had a dream and somebody opened a door and the person said, now let's enter the prophetic. Then I woke up from the dream, it was 3.33. 3.33. And uh, on that occasion, as I woke up, the Lord told me that it was Jeremiah 33, 3, which says, call unto me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know of. So this morning too, when for the dream, I can't go into the dream, but when I woke up, my eyes opened, bam, it was 3, 3, 3. Then I knew exactly what I am. It was referring to. So I went as usual to the place of prayer, started praying, and I was trying to ask the Lord what He has, why uh, He woke me up at 333. Then the Lord began to minister to me. And as a matter of fact, I was even sorry I asked Him. It's like when you go to somebody to ask something, they say, Ah, you, you come. You, I need you. Come, sit down. <laughs> it was your southern. And the Lord was telling me that there's something that I've neglected, you know, something that he entrusted to my hand that I have really um, not given it much attention. And then he, he, he told me why 
he entrusted that thing to my hand and reminded me of where exactly he did that. That was in 2005 in April. And uh, so um, he declared this month of, I mean, the, the next month, month of June, as a month of intimacy, that it has to be a month of intimacy with God. And that was the thing that God entrusted to me in 2005, you know, to talk about it and to stress it and to preach it and all that. And um, I don't think I've done a very good job as far as that is concerned. But this morning, I repented and I told God that I'm going to go back to that. So I'm going to be talking about intimacy with God, building a relationship with God. And uh, you're going to be seeing, hearing it a lot in, in, in my messages, you know, uh, that is, that is, that is what the Lord entrusted to my hand in 2005 for a period of three weeks. For a period of three weeks, it was all full of encounters with God and God drawing me into, um, this kind of intimacy, you know, and then I, I came out of that, you know, it was for a period of three weeks. Uh, for all those three weeks, I, I would just go to the place of prayer and all I, I would do is I would just lie down and cry. Sometimes for three hours, sometimes more, just on my face, weeping. Not because I was sad, but weeping because my spirit was groaning, yearning for a deeper relationship with God. My My spirit had come to a point where it was yearning for a deeper relationship, greater intimacy with God. And that was what actually prepared me for ministry. I had been ministering for 10 years before 2005. I had been involved in teaching and preaching, leading, you know, church activity, you know, um, even leading a church or something for 10 years, you know, before 2005. But that was exactly the, the time that God sowed the seed of ministry. What I'm currently involved in, that was when the seed was sown in my heart. And I believe that it's very important that we always go back to our place of revival, our place of restoration. You know, there's a reason why the early uh, patriarchs, they will always get to a place and then they, will, they wouldn't want to move forward because that place had become a landmark in the spirit that reminded them of something that took place uh, in their work with God. Anytime they got, uh, for instance, when Jacob got to Bethel, that was the exact place that Abraham encountered God. And Abraham built an altar in Bethel. And Jacob got to Bethel in Genesis 28 verse 10. And the Bible said that Jacob said, Bible said he got to a certain place. A certain place. He was talking about, he was talking more about a spiritual location than a geographical location. He got to a certain place. That place was a place where a landmark, a portal was open. A landmark had been established by reason of Abraham's work with God. There was an altar. I doubt if the physical altar was still there, but spiritually that place had become a place where God looked onto. So when Jacob got to that place, he had got to a place of encounter. The only time in the Bible uh, where the word revival is actually used in the original Hebrew is in uh, 2 Kings, when Elisha died and his bones. No, somebody were going to bury somebody and they threw the person uh, in Elisha's tomb. And the bone of Elisha, the person's dead body, came into contact with Elisha's bones, dry bones. And the Bible says the dead man came back to life. That word is the dead man was revived. He was revived. So a lot of times, the way we can be in a constant state of revival is to always touch dry bones, always touch old bones, always go back to a place where you first encountered him. Always go back to a place where he touched you. There are certain things that, they, even there are certain songs that when I hear them right now, memories of 2005 April will start coming to me right now. 
when I hear those songs because that was a place where I encountered God, a place where God touched me. Now, this morning, I want to talk about a journey into the king's chamber. A journey into the king's chamber. And I want you to open your Bibles to Song of Solomon, the most spiritual book in the Bible. Every book of the Bible is spiritual. I'm not trying to say that there are some which are not spiritual, but this one is um, very deep. Let me put that way. One of the very deep writings in the Bible talks about the relationship between Jesus and the church in such intimate terms. You know, people have misconstrued the real meaning of Song of Solomon. Uh, even though Solomon was talking about the love affair between him and a black woman, you know, but it was depicting the relationship that Jesus will have with the church. And when you begin to delve deeper into it and you actually begin to come to terms with the revelation, you will understand that God is a very wise God. So, Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Even the very first chapter, very first verse, you know, if you don't take care, you will not even, you can even collapse. It says, the song of songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments. Your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore the virgins love you. Draw me. We will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. It says the king has brought me into his chambers. And when the king brings you into his chambers, he's talking about a certain kind of intimacy. That he said that he said, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. Then he went on to say that, draw me away and we will run after you. When God is dealing with you, God will always separate you and draw you. But when God finishes dealing with you, you are going to draw other people after you. After God. So he said, draw me away. Me away. I said, we will run after you. That the king has brought me into his chambers. So the king has a chamber. A chamber that he brings us into. When the Bible says that Christianity is a way, the word way connotes a journey. That Christianity is a journey. Christianity is not a religion. It is not, it is never a religion. It is a love relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's a love relationship. A growing love affair between Jesus and the church. That is what is Christianity. That is, that is what the world saw and called us Christians. God never called us Christians. God called us new creation. He, 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 he called us saints. We have been called to be saints. He called us dearly beloved, holy and true. That is God's description of the believer. He calls us kings and priests. He never called us Christians. But the world saw that there was this kind of bond and affection between the church and Christ, which reflected in their actions and what they did and what they didn't do. And the world called them Christians. When Jesus Christ came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, when he says, I am the way, he's saying, I am a journey. The way that leads to the truth, that will give you life. I am the way that leads to the truth, that gives life. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle of Moses was divided into three compartments. 
we had the holy place, the, the, the outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. Now, the outer court, the name that was given to the outer court was the way. And the name that was given to the holy place was the truth. And the name that was given to the holy of holies was the life. That was where God was. That was where the Ark of the Covenant was. So when Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was saying that I am the way into the Holy of Holies. That's why Paul said, before Jesus Christ came, the way into the Holy of Holies was not yet made manifest. It was not open. So Christ came to give us access. That's why I said, now come boldly to the throne of grace. The throne of grace was the Ark of the Covenant. That was where the mercy seat was. That was where God sat. God sat on the mercy seat. He stood above the mercy seat in between the cherubim. And that was, that was, that was the place, that was the Holy of Holies. And when we come born again, we have access to the Holy of Holies. We have direct access access to the Holy of Holies. But don't be deceived. Being granted access does not mean that you will take advantage of it. Does not mean that you will want to go there. Because you can be granted a pass, a permit to go to the castle, to go to the flaster house to see the president. But you actually going there is dependent on you. As far as he is concerned, he has given you all you need to be able to come. As I said, come boldly. Don't allow A or B to prevent you from coming. Come boldly. So if you will go, then you can experience him. That is why we have levels in our Christian lives. Even though the same Holy Spirit lives in us, and we have the same access to the Father, there are degrees of knowledge of God. There are people who are born again with access to the Father who only know God as a master. There are others who are born again with access to the Father who have gone ahead to know God as a Father. There are others also who have gone ahead to know God as a partner. You see, Jesus Christ to the disciples, I said, you are my friends. He said, you are my friends. He said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But you are my friends. Then, and that was the highest status they could ever attain before Jesus died. Then Jesus died, then rose from the dead. Then he met Mary Magdalene and said, go and tell my brethren and Peter. He said, go and tell my brethren that I go to my God and your God. To my father and your father. So there are levels of relationship that we can have towards God. The father, the, under the New Testament, we have been brought into or we have been granted access into the Holy of Holies. Does not mean that we will take advantage of it. Like I said at that time, in the time of David, there were two tabernacles. One was the tabernacle of David, which was preached on Mount Zion. And the other was the tabernacle of Moses, which was preached on Mount Gibeah. Uh, but the, the, the Bible makes it clear that the two tabernacles were there. It was there. You could go to either of them. But there were people who were still going to Moses' tabernacle, even though the, that tabernacle did not contain the ark. Even though for a period of 70 years, there was no ark in Moses' tabernacle, people still went there. What did they go there to do? What did they go to the ark to do? They went there to worship God. But God was not in the ark. So the ark, I mean, God was not in the tabernacle because the ark was not there. So the, the, the tabernacle was there. People went there as usual, going through rituals and ceremonies and going through the motions, but they never experienced the presence of God. The ark was on Mount Zion in David's tabernacle. And in David's tabernacle, there, was, there were no veils. You just entered the tabernacle and you saw the ark. In fact, it was just a tent, just a curtain. You know, and the ark was placed uh, in that tent. So you just enter and then 
you see the ark. So you have a choice either to go to the temple of Moses to go through the motions, have your 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 your, your sheep slaughtered by the priest, sprinkled on the on the brazen altar, go through the motions and all that without any ark, or go to the temple of David and then encounter God. So Jesus Christ said, He said that He is the way that leads to the life, that that leads to the truth. That gives life. Life is in the Holy of Holies. And that is where we have been granted access. We have access to the Holy of Holies. You know, um, when you when you enter the tabernacle, the first thing that you will see, you will see the brazen altar. You will see the brazen altar, which is a very big altar. That's the only altar in the outer court. And that was where all the slaughtering of the sheep took place you know that the priest will take your sheep your lamb and he will slaughter it pour the blood and all that it all took place in the outer court when you leave the brazen altar you will get to the lava the lava was like a bowl that contained water that was the water that the priest used to wash their head their hands and their feet before they will go into the holy place you see that's why peter said that then wash my hand and my my head also, not only my feet. You know, he, he, he understood something like that. And that was the lava. From the lava, you 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 will get to the door of the holy place. Now that one is talking about the church. You see, the door of the holy place had five pillars, five pillars standing for the fivefold ministry of apostle, prophet, evangelist. Um, Pastor and teacher. That was the door of the uh, the door that led into the holy place. Um, I'm not I'm not teaching on that. That's why I'll, I'll just be passing through. When you enter the holy place, you you will meet three articles, three furniture, piece of furniture. You you will meet the 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 lampstand, the golden lampstand on your right. The golden lampstand was um. A lamp stand made of seven lamps, or it was just one piece of metal, and out of that, they 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 came out with seven branches of lamp, with all having one base, one bowl, with oil in it, and each one of the lamps had a wick. You know, the wick was from the top, the, the top there, the knob, down to the 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 base where the oil was. So they would light all the lamp. That was the, the golden lampstand. It was golden. Everything in the holy place was pure gold. Then from there you, you had the table of show bread on your, on your left. That was a, a, a table, pure gold. And it had 12 loaves of bread arranged in rows. You know, six year, six year, 12 loaves. And the 12 loaves of bread was supposed to be there for one week, seven days. One week, seven days. So on the seventh day, the priest, the priest will go and remove it and they will eat it. Then they will replace it with fresh bread. It had to be fresh all the time. You know, they will spice it with frankincense and other things. You know. Then we had the, uh, the golden altar of incense right before the veil. That was golden incense, altar of incense. That was where they put the incense and they burned incense to God. Incense is a type of prayer, worship, intercession. You see, may my prayer be like incense unto you. And the lifting up of my hand be like the evening sacrifice. So incense is a type of prayer that ascends to God. Revelation 8, 5. So Revelation 8, 8, verse 5, downwards. You see that the much incense was given to the angels to add to the prayers of the saints. The, the, the prayers of the saints and the angels added incense to it. But all these things, all these pieces of furniture and all that, the most important was the ark. And the ark was locked up in the Holy of Holies and there was a thick curtain, the veil, that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And the curtain was so thick that, I mean, no human being could just rip it off like that. And only one person had access to the place. That's a high priest. 
and even that one once in a year. So in the Old Testament, access to the, I mean, real intimacy with God was not granted. They didn't have access to intimacy with God. That door was not open. But the Bible says that the veil stood for the flesh of Jesus. When Jesus Christ died, the veil that separated the holy of holies from the holy place was torn. Not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. To prove to everybody that it was God who tore the veil. Because the thickness and the height, no man can just go and tear it from top to bottom. So when Jesus Christ died, the veil was torn from top to bottom. That was when God left the temple. That was when he left the temple. He said, Jerusalem, now your house has been left to you desolate. Now your house. When God leaves the temple, it becomes your house. When, when God leaves the temple, it becomes your house. That's why when you start saying, my church, my church, it means God has left. When he leaves, it becomes your church. Then you begin to do anything as you want. My church. Now, so, this shows that God sees intimacy as very important. Let me surprise you. The greatest need of God is for fellowship and relationship with man. Somebody said, does God have a need? Yes. God has a need. He says, the father is seeking, seeking for worshippers. Now, if you are seeking for something, it means you have a need. But God doesn't have a need out of uh, deficiency. He has a need out of his sovereignty. What I mean is that God enjoyed perfect fellowship in the Trinity. The Bible talks about the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery. You know, that was hidden before even Christ came. And that was a, the perfect fellowship that existed between the Godhead, among the Godhead. The Godhead was the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And, 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 and these three, you know, they are one. And they had perfect fellowship. So, there was, there was nothing like a deficiency. But you see, God, out of his own sovereignty, chose to create man for relationship and fellowship. And he made it such a way that he will always need the fellowship and relationship of man. That is one thing that angels up to now, they can't understand. That why is it, David said, who is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visit him? He said, you have made him a little lower than Elohim. And you have crying with glory and honor. And you have put all your ways under his feet. He said, who is man? He, he, he tried to understand. He couldn't. Why is God so passionate about man? Why is God always going after man? You imagine when Adam sinned against God. God couldn't sit down. He had to go after man. Adam, where are you? I mean, it was God who was always coming to the, to the garden to have fellowship. It wasn't man who was going to God. It was God always coming to have fellowship with man. Which means that there is something that God has created in putting man that he is always looking for. That is intimacy. God is love. And the, the highest expression of love is giving. Any love is expressed. The highest way you can express love is giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. Greater love has no man than this. That a man should lay down his life. Give his life for his brethren, his friends. So, love must be expressed. And love must be expressed through giving. Now, love must always have an object. That will receive. You see, God created man as an object that will receive his love. That will receive his love. So, you see, if you trace the, the, the story of the Trinity, in eternity past, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, they were there. Um, it, it's, it's not the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit. No, it is the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Now, the Father had a desire for sons. And if you trace it through the Bible, you will see that 
God finally attained that desire in Christ, when he had a son, he was so happy. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He had not performed even a single miracle. You know, he had not done anything. He was just going to be baptized. And God said, ah, now I've gotten a son. This is my desire. That I will get man. I will be able to produce a son out of man. Somebody who can receive my love and also return it to me. The word also had a desire for a bride. That's, that's the desire of the word. For a bride. So the word was made flesh. Then he came looking for a bride. I'll talk about that later. The spirit too had a desire for a temple. A temple. So that's why at the end. In the church. God has also attained the desire of the spirit for a temple. He said you all are being built together. Into a spiritual habitation of the spirit. Five. You are living stones and you are being built together into a spiritual habitation of the spirit. So God desires relationship and fellowship. That is, that, is, that is one thing that God has chosen to make himself vulnerable. One way he has chosen to make himself vulnerable. Out of his own sovereignty, he has chosen to make himself vulnerable. That he will need the love of man. That he will Give love and expect love to be returned to him. So anytime love is not returned to God, he feels very sad. Sometimes very angry. You can look at the way he dealt with the Israelites. I mean, he will first get you and pour himself out to you. Show love to you. Then instead of returning the love to God, they return the love to other gods. Then God was angry. He got to point. God said, Moses, permit me. I want to just clear them off. I want to consume all of them. And look, I will make you a nation. Moses, I want to con- because it's like he was so grieved. But thank God for people like Moses who said, far be from you. He said, well, repent of this evil. Yeah, he was the one who was able to force God to repent. <laughs> he said, and God repented of the evil. He changed his mind. Why? Because there was an intercessor there was Moses who said, no way, I won't allow you to make me a nation. These people are your nation. They've sinned against you. They say, oh, oh they've really sinned against you. Uh, but um, if you forgive them, fine. But if not, then blot my name out of your book. Hmm. You see, there, there are few people in the Bible who were great intercessors. One of them was Moses. He was a very great intercessor. One of them was Samuel. Noah, Job, Daniel, Paul. The Apostle Paul said, I wish that I was accursed for the sake of my brethren. I wish that I was accursed, that I will go to hell and Israel will be saved. I mean, I, I don't wish that I will go to hell for somebody to be saved. <laughs> but that was a level of it that Paul got to. He said, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. That was the, 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 the fellowship of his suffering. He said, I, I, like, like Jesus, I wish I was a okay so that my brightness will be saved. Now, God created man for four purposes. Four purposes. And the first one is for fellowship and relationship. That's why man was created in the image of God. So that man could receive from God. You, you, can't, you can't, for instance, even we human beings, we can't fellowship with animals. We can't. We can play with them. We can give them food. I mean, but we, we can't fellowship with animals. We can't sit down and have a reasonable chat with a dog. It's not possible. Because you are not in the same image. You understand? No matter how you train a dog, the dog cannot talk with you. It can listen to you. It can take instruction, but it cannot return. It cannot, it cannot. There's no communication is a two-sided affair. Two-way traffic. But a dog cannot give you that. In the same way, the reason why God created man in his image was because he wanted a being 
who could receive his love and give it back to him. To receive his love and then return the love to him. He said, we love him because he first loved us. He always did the initiative to love. But he always expressed the love to be returned to him. So it was for fellowship and relationship. Number two, God created man to contain God. So man was designed to contain spirit. That's why man is a spirit. We were designed to be able to contain spirits. That is why even if you, you, you don't contain God, you can contain evil spirit. Because that's your makeup. You were designed to be able to contain spirit. Because God had in mind that a time will come he would like to live in man. He would like to live in man and then through man work out his plans and purposes. With Adam, he was enjoying fellowship with Adam, giving him instruction and all that. But he had a plan that the time will come, I will put my very life in Adam. Then I will be controlling things from the inside. So the unseen God will live in the unseen spirit of the seen man to affect the seen world. That was, that was God's plan. Number three, God created man to represent him. That's why he created man in his image. So, for fellowship, relationship, number two, to be a container of God. Number three, to represent God. So, God had to create man in the same way that he is. So that man can be a perfect representative of God. That's the meaning of the word image. Then that number four, to have dominion, to do his works. That is to have dominion, to have dominion. You see, Adam had fellowship and relationship with God. He was given dominion and he represented God. But the one thing that he never was able to do was to contain God. That one, key, that one couldn't materialize. And then he, he fell. If he had not fallen, he would have eaten the tree of life. And the tree of life would have become God's very life in man. And that would have taken man to a higher level of relationship with God. Which we are now enjoying. So what we, we have now is higher than what Adam had. People sometimes say, that, oh, Jesus Christ came, came take us back to the, where Adam was. No, no, no. He took us higher than Adam. Adam didn't have the life of God dwelling in him. We have the Zoe, the uncreated life of God, eternal life of God dwelling in us by reason of our uh, receiving the free gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ. Now, the foundation of all that was relationship and fellowship. The earth was created for the heavens. The earth. No, let me put it this way. The heavens was created to serve the earth. In Genesis 1.14, the Bible said that God placed lights in the heavens to give light on the earth and for signs and seasons upon the earth. So the heavens were actually created for the earth. And the earth was created for man. In Isaiah 45 verse 8, he said, God created the earth. He created the earth to be inhabited. He didn't create it vain. So that was why God formed the earth. It was formed to be inhabited by man. Then man was created for God. So man's chief need is for God. And God's highest regard is for man. The crown of God's creation is man. Angels don't understand why God keeps going after man. Man will fall. Then God will say, I, I, let's give you a chance. I want him. Then he will come and he will, he will come as a man to save man. Die for man. And do all these things. And they don't understand. Bible says they look steadfastly into our salvation. They are making inquiries all the time. 
sometimes they, 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 they don't get it. Why God is so passionate about this being called man. But the reason is that there is something God needs from man. He has made himself vulnerable by needing something from man. So we say the father himself seeks such ones to worship him. He's searching, uh, seeking, searching for somebody to worship him. He said, my eyes are searching to and fro the earth. Looking for somebody who is of a loyal heart. So God needs something from us. Without him, we can do nothing. But without us, he will do nothing. Without us, he will do nothing. He has made it so. Hallelujah. So, we are the objects that God wants to lavish his love on. And he wants us to retain his love. So, when we get to a place where we don't release the love back to him, he gets hurt. Come to Ezekiel 16. Let me show you something. Look at how God is describing his relationship with the Israelites. Very, very, very uh, interesting. Ezekiel 16. I will read 1 to 5. I want to search, then I will jump to 15. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, call Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, That is the Lord God to Jerusalem. Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. Nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not wrapped with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you in your blood, leave. Yes, I said to you in your blood, leave. I made you thrive like a plant in a field and you grew, matured and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was a time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you and you became mine, says the Lord. 15. But you trusted in your own beauty, played the hallowed because of your fame, and poured out your hallowed tree on everyone passing by who have it. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played, played the hallowed on them. Verse 17. You are also taking my, your beautiful jewelry from my gold and my silver which I had given you. And made for yourself male images. And play the harlots with them. I mean. God God was very very angry with them. Because according to him. He was the one who gave all to them. And he was expecting. Love back from them. They didn't get it. And he became so angry. He said look you. He was, he was telling them where, where they came from. He said look you. When I saw you you were naked. Your mother had given birth to you and your, your navel cord was not even cut. And you were this and that and I took you and I washed you and I dressed you up, fed you, you grew. Now you've seen that you've grown. You said you are beautiful. You are going after other men. And God was jealous. That's why we say that God is a jealous God. Because when love is not returned, it's very painful. Even you a human being, when you give your love to somebody, and the person doesn't return your love. You feel hurt. You feel cheated. People can't even take their life because of that. That's how God feels. When he bestows love. And love doesn't come back. So God wants to be our main preoccupation. He wants to be the most important person in our lives. He wants to be the one who gives us our dreams. 
the one that we will stand up for, the one that we will sit down for, the one whose instructions will control us. He is a very jealous God. He, he wants to be the one who who's at, I mean, he wants, he wants to be the only person who gets your attention. The only person who gets your attention. He said he's a jealous God. So sometimes when God even blesses us, he's always looking to see whether the blessing is taking us away from him. God is a loving God. He loves to give. He doesn't mind lavishing you with, with precious gifts. But the moment those gifts begin to draw you away from God, he gets hurt. And he feels like a lover who has been jilted. That's how God feels today in the church. Today he feels like a lover who has been jilted. His love has been taken for granted. And he wants the church to return to their first love. For us to return to our first love because we have neglected him. When he gave us the gift, we became so consumed with the gift. And we ignore him. Like you've done a wedding. Then for you to follow your husband to the, uh, the room. You are, you, are, you are distracted by the wedding parcels. And you are just unwrapping the wedding parcels and all that. Your husband is waiting for you. Come, I'm waiting for you in the, in the room, in the bedroom. And say, oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. This one is from uh, so and so. It's very nice. We'll hang this one here. Uh, this one too. This, oh, it's very nice. And the man is getting impatient. <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> so, God will always give you the test to find out whether your heart is in the things he gives you or in he himself. That's the reason why there is revival. That's the reason why he comes to renew him. Revival is a time where God is telling the church. Come back to your first love. What happened to you? Come back to the time that we first met. When we were lovers. Now you are distracted by so many things. Distracted by the world. Distracted by your beauty. Your giftings. The things I gave you. Come back to me. Let's become lovers again. So he, he, he went to Abraham. Abraham waited for 25 years for Isaac. And then God wanted to make sure that Abraham's heart was not in the gift. It got to a point, to be very frank, it got to a point, it was like the promise was not coming. The Bible says Abraham did not stagger, but he believed God. After waiting for 25 years and getting Isaac for maybe another 30 years, 50 years or more of working with God, then God came to Abraham. Give me your Isaac. God was trying to test him to see whether his heart was now in the gift or was in God. Do you know why sometimes we feel God? Even at the last end of our ministry, we can feel God. Anytime what God has given us, you know, God can give us a lot of things. God gives us wealth. God can give you a name. He will bless you with a name. When God gives you a name, you get fame. You become famous. So, God can make you famous by giving you a name. He can make you wealthy, giving you riches and all that blessing. He can give you powerful gifts. Powerful gifts. But the, the, the situation always is like that. When we get to a place where we look around us and we see all the things that God gave us, we become complacent and we think that we have been able to accomplish all these things. That is when we take God for granted. We take God for granted. So he said, give me Isaac, your only son whom you love. Give him to me. It was a test. Whether Abraham would say, no, you know how I struggle to get this child Isaac. I won't give him to you. This is the only thing I have. Please. Don't touch this one. That I'm believers. God, please, this one, they don't touch it. You can touch everything, but please, this one, don't touch it. Solve our problem for us, but don't touch our pigs. <laughs> the madman of Gadara, when Jesus healed the man, they were happy. But when he sent the demon into the, into the pigs, and the pigs went into the sea, 
The people came and said, go away from our town. So, solve our problems for us. But please, don't touch my pigs. <laughs> so, God is hurt when we take him for granted. So, in John 21, verse 1 to 17, I want to read it. Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. And Bible says that Simon Peter and uh, Nathaniel and uh, um, uh, Thomas and uh, James and John and two other disciples, seven people, they were there. And Simon said that, I'm going to fish. I'll go fishing. Then they all said, ah, if Peter is going fishing, let's also follow him. We all will go fishing. They went and told the whole night. They didn't catch a single fish. You know, the Lord was showing me something from this passage. He said that, when you get to the seventh dimension, you don't have to toil. If you toil, you won't catch anything. There were seven people. They are going to seven dimensions. And instead of them soaring, because now, Peter, even when you were, you were a serious businessman, you left out to follow Jesus. Now that you've lost your business, everything following Jesus, now that short time that you have to wait for whole field to come, you are going to fish. <laughs> so he told and caught nothing. Throughout the night. But in the morning, Jesus Christ came in the morning. When he came in the morning, he said, children, have you any food? He said, no. Then he said, okay, lay, cast the net at the right side. At the right side. And they cast the net at the right side. And they came up with a lot of fish. 153 big fish. But the net did not break that was a miracle. The Bible was careful to add that, and yet the net did not break. Why? Because in Luke 5, when Jesus Christ met Peter, at that time, Peter was, was, was new to Jesus. He had not known him for a very long time. Jesus said, give me your boat, Simon. He gave him his boat. Then he said, now, let down your nets. That one was plural. Nets, N E T S. The Peter said, Oh, Master, we've toiled all night. <laughs> you see, toiling is always in the night because weeping may endure for a night, but in the morning you don't toil because joy comes in the morning. He said, We've toiled all night, but we didn't catch any fish. Then, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets, singular. And Peter let down the net, singular, and he broke. The net broke. But this time, Jesus said, now, let down your net, singular. And that one net was able to contain many fishes. One, five, three large fishes. And the Bible was careful to note that, and yet the net did not break because it was a miracle. Which means that, you see, when, when you get to the seventh dimension, it's not, it's not about your effort. It's not about how you struggle to make it. How you toil. It's about soaring. It's about resting on his promises. It's about being confident. Being assured of this very thing. Being fully persuaded. It's about casting all your cares on the Lord. For he cares about you. It's about re releasing everything to God. The one who was toiling all night came and the one who was at the seashore had coals of fire and there were fish on the fire. He invited them for breakfast. He said, bring some of the fish you caught. Come and add it to mine and let's eat. And they ate breakfast. I mean, they ate breakfast. Eating breakfast is not a sin. <laughs> Eating breakfast is not a sin. Jesus ate breakfast. Who told you it's a sin? <laughs> Jesus ate. The, the said, after they had eaten breakfast, then he asked Peter, Simon, love, lovest thou me more than this? Peter, do you really love me more than these fishes and boats and nets? 
these things. Do you really love him? He said, yes, I love you, Lord. He said, okay, if you love me, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more? The second time, he said, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, okay, tend my lambs. Third time, Peter, do you really love me? He said, oh, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He said, really, if you love me, then feed my sheep. What he was saying was that, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Or that the things I gave you can distract you from loving me? Can distract you from giving me your full attention? The very things I do for you can make you take me for granted. Do you know that the things that people do for people, the people who are in our lives that who really are of help to us, we take them for granted. We take them for granted. The only time we see that we have we have really taken them for granted is when they leave the scene, when they die. They say, ah. I thank God for so and so. You know, if I didn't know, I, but you know, I, now that he's not around, now I know that I've really lost somebody. Because you were seeing the person all the time, you took the person for granted. So, people that we are with in the same household, we are likely to take them for granted. That's why the cure for that is that we should always go back to our first love. The reason for revivals upon revivals is for the church to always go back to a place of first love. Jesus Christ is coming for a young, passionate bride, not an old woman. He's coming for a bride without spot and wrinkle. Without spot means a life of purity. Without wrinkle means a life of passionate young love. That the church will not be an old woman. The church will not have any wrinkle. An old woman. The church will always be a young and fresh bride. Who is passionately in love with their groom. That's God's plan for the church. And that's why God always tells the church. Come back to your first love. He enjoys the first love thing. We often say that familiarity breeds contempt. Very, very true. Familiarity will breed contempt. People who are around you, you tend to be familiar with them. And you tend to take them for granted. Take them for granted. The things they do for you, you may not acknowledge them. But if they are not there, then you know. For instance, there are many people. You no, know, I had a story of somebody who said that um, he came to, he, he went to work, then he came, he came back from work to meet his wife, and then he told the wife, "You, I go out there and I toil and I, I, I struggle, and you sit here all day, you are doing nothing." Then one day, God said, "The two of you change positions." <laughs> So the man became the wife and the wife became the man. God said, just change position for one day. Then the man saw that after the husband left and the children left, because she was a wife, housewife now, now she was saddled with all these house chores. She had to get this, do many things at the same time. And he went, hey, my wife is really doing a very big, big, big job. All these things, if I were to pay for them, the money they would charge me. So, when the evening came, the, the film money told God, he said, I can't do it. I'm very, very tired. I, 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 can't, I, I can't do it. I'm tired. So, you just, let's reverse again. And God said, unfortunately, last night you got pregnant. <laughs> so, you must carry the pregnancy for another nine months. Say, oh, have mercy. <laughs> So that's how familiarity can breed contempt. That's why God always says, 
come back to the first love, the place where we first met. Uh, if Revelation 2, verse 1 to 7. Revelation 2, verse 1 to 7. The Ephesian church. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. This is a perfect church. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore from where you are fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Then, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give to each from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Every church had a promise to overcome it. Every church, all the seven churches, each one of them had a promise that Jesus gave to overcome it. But look at the promise he's given to this, this church. He said, He who overcomes, I will let him eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Thinking about going back to the garden. Say, so, I want you to come back to the garden where the two of us were walking and taking a stroll in the garden. I want you to come back to the place of love. First love. The place of first love. That's, that's why revivals always, uh, revive, God always brings revival. When it gets to a point where we are becoming too familiar and we are following after other things, neglecting him, sometimes we sacrifice him for our doctrines, sacrifice intimacy for the, the ministry, the things we, we are doing for God, sacrifice intimacy for our business and our family and other things. Even for the ministry. You can be running around doing ministry and you have left your first love. Very, very scary. Very dangerous. You can be operating the gifts of God and you have left your first love. There is no personal touch anymore. One thing I've discovered recently is that God gives the gifts and sometimes God promotes you to a level when you get to that level, after following God for some time, when you get to that level, things will flow automatically. That is when you will backslide. When you get to a point where, without even prayer, you can stand and minister. Oh yes, you can stand and minister. You can, you can, you can stand and prophesy. You can move in the spirit. You can teach. Without prayer. That is the point where it is very easy to backslide. This morning, well, Lord, Lord told me that backsliding is not fornication and adultery. He said, that one, you are falling into sin. Backsliding is when I no longer turn you on. When there is no intimacy between you and me again, when the things that used to give you joy, me, that I used to give you joy, I'm no longer the one who gives you joy. You have backslided. He said, I want you to repent and come back to your first love. The place where I met you, how passionate you were, how you couldn't wait to get into my presence. You couldn't wait to have fellowship with me. How your prayer was, oh God, that I may know you and know you and know you. Now your prayer is, oh God, open my eyes. Oh God, give me a healing gift. Oh God, give me revelation. And all these are good prayers 
But God is saying that come back to the place where your prayer was, oh God, oh God, anything, anything that will stand between you and you, take it away. I prayed that prayer in 2005. Say, so, oh God, anything that I will love be more than you, take it away. I, I prayed it in April. My wife was, was in labor in August. And it was difficult. And when they called me, I went to the, I, I said, God, I don't, I, I'm sure it's, it's not what I said that. <laughs> I, I don't think it's what I said that is happening. I, I go to a point, I said, anything that, will, that I will love more than you, Lord, take it away. That was how desperate I become. I will just, I will just weep with God. I don't want anything to come between you and I. Anything that will, I will love more than you, just take it away. God says, I want you to go back to that place. This morning he told me. He said, I want you to go back to that place. That's the place, that's, that's the place See, all that you are looking for is in that place. That's the place of encounter. That's the place of everything God. The place of intimacy. It's a place of intimacy. Hallelujah. It's a place of intimacy. A place where God becomes our, our utmost obsession. Where loving him becomes our priority. Where we spend time with him, not because we want something, but because we just love him. We just want to be with him. I just want to be with you. When you are in love, look at how you can't wait to be in the presence of your lover. Who has been in love before? Don't raise your hand. Eh? <laughs> so, when you are in love, you can't wait to be in the presence of your lover. Even sometimes hearing the voice on the phone is enough to excite you. <laughs> when you hear the voice alone on the phone, it's enough to, to excite you. You see, when you are in love, your conversation is about one each other. Somebody said, mm. <laughs> "When you are in love, your focus is on each other. You can sit there and converse. You are talking to each other. I love you. I love you. I do this. I you. It's, it's you. 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 After some time, you sit there and converse. All right." But now the focus is not each other. Now it's the children's school fees. Now it's, oh, what happened in church? At my workplace. At this place. Now the focus shifts from you and I. You and I. It moves to things. Have you seen that our prayer life now is dominated by things, 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 things? Things. Not him. When was the last time you went to him just to worship him? Just to express your love. That I love you. I love you. I'm not here for anything. I just want to be in your presence. I just want to say I love you. That is what God is looking for. If God can get us doing that all the time, I'm telling you, we will never fail. But the problem is, human as we are, we often get distracted. Like he told me this morning. I was, I was going, uh, no, when, when I woke up at 333, I knew it was Jeremiah 333. Uh, 3, 3. And I was going to ask him, so, Lord, you know, next month is a month of uh, strategic and detailed prophetic. And uh, Jeremiah 333 3, 3 says, call unto me. Are you trying to tell me anything about next month, about the, 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 what you have said and all that? He said, how you come? I'll be looking for you. <laughs> you know something? God, he said, the prophetic, the simple, the simplest 
definition of a prophet is a friend of God. If, if you want a prophet, we are talking about a friend of God. That's why people who spend time with God, they become prophetic. If you spend time with God and you are always in prayer, always in worship, you will break into prophetic. You become prophetic. Because that's where you hear the, God, the voice of God. A prophet is not somebody who ministers a gift. You see, one day, the Lord told me something. He said, I'm coming to my church and I'm coming to measure. You know, in Revelation, he said he measured the temple and measured the people in the temple. And God said, I'm bringing my measuring rod to be applied to everything in my church, including the offices. A teacher is not somebody who can break the word. A teacher is somebody that we can see the teacher through. An evangelist is not somebody who can preach. Anybody can preach. But an evangelist, an evangelist is made in the king's chamber. If God finds one person who is willing to be in his presence, he can make an evangelist out of him. One woman said, come and see, I've met a man and the whole town. Revival in the whole city because one woman met Jesus and she was prepared to enter intimacy. An apostle is not somebody who, who moves with signs and wonders or who, who teaches or who leads An apostle is somebody who has become an ambassador. And ambassadors are made in the king's chamber. So, intimacy is everything to God. Everything to God. That's why I said, he who overcomes, that means, he will go back to his first love. I will give him to each of the tree of life and I will take you to the garden. God wants us to go back to the garden. Eden is a place where his presence becomes your utmost obsession. Where God becomes an addiction to you. Do you know why uh, Satan brought uh, alcohol and drugs and all that? When man left Eden, man won- I mean, there was something about Eden that kept man glued to God. God is addictive. His presence is addictive. So, man was so addicted to God's presence and the effects of being in his presence was joy. When man left the Garden of Eden, man lost something. And Satan said, I can produce something that will replace the joy you lost in Eden. Alcohol. So, you take drugs and you get high. But you always come low again. Because the, the, the high that you get, it cannot take you to the one that you, are, you have in eating. The pleasure you will get from, from, from alcohol, it can never be compared to the joy of his presence. So God wants us to become like addicts. Who can wait for their next fix? David said, when shall I appear before my God? He said, my soul yearns for you and my flesh thirsts for you in a dry and weary place where there's no water. To, to see you, to come and see you. He said, what thing have I desired? That I may, I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever and behold the beauty of the king. God said, that's a man after my heart. A man after. That's why David was the most secured leader. The most secured king. Look at David. His own son was ready to take his throne. He said, <laughs> No, let's go. You see, David, David's heart was, was fixed on God. 
So, the cure for that is that sometimes we need to retreat. We need to retreat and we need to go back to our first love. When you see that you are plateauing, you see that now nothing excites you anymore. It's like your love for God has gone down. And you will know. You may be growing in the gifts of the spirit, but you may see that, you're, that, you, that you are empty. It's time to hit the king's chamber. It's time to retreat. It's time to go back and say, God, I've come. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Just breathe on me. I've, I've, just fix me. Fix me. Just, just work on me. I've come. Fix me. And God knows how to fix you. This morning, the Lord showed you something. I was amazed. He said, I always come to the well to wait, but you don't come. He said, I always come to the well to wait. I come to the well to wait, but you don't come. Talking about how he's always yearning for our fellowship, the church. But we, we feel him. So now, he's standing uh, at the door of his own church and he's knocking. That scripture is not for unbelievers. So, Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and I'm knocking. No, no, he's standing at the door of the church. The Laodicean church, which is the seventh age church, which is our times. He's standing at the door and he's knocking. Knocking, 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 knocking. Can I have a place here? Can I have a place here? Can I have a place here? Say, oh, no, 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 no. There's no place here. All the, uh, the, all the rooms are booked. Say, ah, okay. Go, go, go. Is there any room I can lay my head? The son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Is there a place I can be the head? Is there a place I can be the source of their dreams? Is there a place where I can be the boss? Say, no, there's no vacancy here. And I love that. Now, he has to go back to the stable the manger. Because what happened when Mary was carrying him is happening now. There are a lot of in, 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 inns and guest houses and hotels. The church is not a hotel. The church is the house of God. God must be able to dwell there and be comfortable. But we have turned the church into hotels. And now Jesus doesn't have a place in his own house. So he's standing outside and knocking and we are saying, no, there's no vacancy here. We, 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 we don't want to hear. We are, we are busy. We have our programs. We are busy with our programs. He said, I want a place where I can, I can lay my head. So he has to go to the stable again, to the manger. That's why the most unlikely places, the most unlikely people, the next move, God is going to shift his attention to the most unlikely people, the most unlikely places, who experienced God's move. Why? Because those who were bidden to the banquet, they turned him, him down. He said, I come to the well. Do you know that I discovered this morning from scripture that the well was always a place where people met. And let me tell you something. All the patriarchs, they met their wives at the well. <laughs> yeah, I just saw it this morning. All the patriarchs met their their wives by the well. Abraham was the one that God called. God called him out of his house. Abraham dug, he, he built altars, pitched tents, and he dug wells. When Abraham wanted a bride for Isaac, he sent his servant, Genesis 24, to go and look for a bride. He got to a place where there was a well and he stood there. He said, oh God, let it be as the maidens come to draw water. The one that I will make a request and say, give me water. And then she will say, oh, let me fetch some for your donkeys also. 
let her be the one that you have chosen for my master's son. So Isaac's wife was found at the well. Rebecca came with a pitcher on her head as she was coming to fetch water. Then Abraham's servant met her. That was then she, he followed her to the house. I thought the guys would get something from this. Your Rebecca is always willing to fetch water not only for you, but also for your donkeys. <laughs> you still don't get it, eh? <laughs> I say your Rebecca. Rebecca's will always want to fetch water for you and also for your donkeys. <laughs> if there are donkeys following you. <laughs> now, Jacob found his wife by the well. He, in, 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 in Genesis 29, verse 9 to 11, he got to a place and there was a well. Then he saw Rachel coming. That was how they met, by the well. Now, Joseph, he didn't find his wife by the well. He himself was cast into a well. But there was no water in the well. But in, 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 in Genesis 49, when Jacob was blessed, he said, Joseph is a fruitful bow beside a well. So, he, he didn't find his wife by a well, but he was cast into a well, an empty well. There was no water in the well. He was cast into it. You know, they wanted to cut short his generation. Because, Genesis 47, and this is the generation of Jacob, Joseph. You get it. He said, Bible says, and this is the generation of Jacob, Joseph being 17. I mean, are you talking about Jacob, the son or Joseph? He was the one who was the, 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 the captain of their salvation. He had to be made perfect through suffering. So he was cast into a well. There was no water. But he became a fruitful bough beside the well. Do you know that Moses also met his wife at the well? Exodus 2.15 That was where he met his wife. They got to the well and sat down. The women were coming. Then there were some people who were trying to bully Zipporah because they were only ladies, seven girls. Then Moses stood and fought them and he fed their sheep. In fact, Jacob and Moses, they fed the sheep of their wives. But Rebecca fed the sheep of uh, her husband. So, Moses too. Now, let me come to Exodus 15, 27. I want to show you something. And I will bring it to this ministry and then you will see that God is talking to us. Exodus 15, 27. When Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, he came to this place called Elim. Elim, 15, 27. Okay. It says, Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. So they come there by the waters. Twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. You see, the righteous have flourished like a palm tree. That's that's God's government. God's government is twelve seventy. Twelve seventy. There were 12, 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. When they were going to Egypt, there were 70 people. 70 souls. It's 12. God will first of all get the 12. The 12 are wells. They are wells for generation. They generate the 70. Now, when God wants to bring Israel to a city, he will get the 12. The number 12 is vibrating. The 12 stands for government. Jesus Christ had two apostles and 70 disciples. Do you know that? He sent two apostles first. Matthew 10. Then he sent 70 others also. Luke 10. So 12 and 70. That is, that is God's, God's order. That's why um, uh, uh, um, in the New Jerusalem, the walls of the city had 12 foundations. 
So, when we dig to our wells, when God gets a remnant, and then God asks them to dig, and they dig, out of that, you see, the well stands for generations. Jacob's well served many generations. Then the 70 is formed. When the 70 is formed, then revival takes place. But the reason why Jesus said that I always come to the well is in John 4. There are certain points in the life of the church where Jesus comes to sit at the well. Waiting for us. In John 4, when it's for the sixth hour, the sixth hour, Jesus went and sat by the well. The sixth hour. The sixth hour. He went and sat by the well. And he was waiting for something. He was hungry. He was hungry. And the disciples thought that he was hungry for food. So they went outside looking for food for him to eat. But his hunger was for something else. He was looking for a bride. He was looking for intimacy, fellowship. It was the sixth hour. A very unusual time to go to the well. Because the woman used to come in the evening. Abraham's servant met Rebecca in the evening. That was when the woman often go to draw water from the well. But Jesus said, no, I get hungry in the sixth hour. I, I, I'm just going to sit down there and wait. I don't know who is coming, but I'm waiting. And the disciples couldn't interpret the significance of his hunger, so they went out looking for food to feed him. Here comes this woman, a Samaritan, carrying a pot, coming to fetch water. And Jesus said, Give me water to drink. So, if she was like Rebecca, she would have said, Oh, let me also, I do you have any donkeys? Let me also feed the donkeys. But she said, how, how is it that you, a Jew, you are asking me, a Samaritan woman, water? And they began, you know, exchanging words and all that. Words and all that. Then they got to a point. Jesus told the woman, go and bring your husband. You see, at this point, God was looking for a bride. But the bride of God had five husbands. And she was struggling with the sixth one. And Jesus was coming to take her to meet the seventh one. She had, she had five husbands, five dispensations. Innocence, conscience, human government, promise, and the law. And now, she's coming to meet grace. In fact, grace, she was with grace, but it was not settled. Even the one you are with now, he is not really your husband. Then, the woman said, I know you were a prophet. Because of the way you are explaining things to me, how you're able to trace my past and bring it to the present, you were a prophet. That's it. He said, go, go and call your that, that was it. He said, go and call your husband. Because now her spirituality was a bit heightened. He said, Now go and call your husband. Now I want to show you what your problem really is. By the time Jesus finished dealing with the woman, the woman left the water pot. She came to fetch water, but she left the water pot. There was something that she let go because she had met the water of life. So, when the woman was satisfied, she was satisfied because she left without the water. He said, and the woman left the water pot and went into the city. When Jesus saw that, Jesus said, this is worship. 
The father is looking for worshippers. I found a worshipper. I found somebody who considered me more important than her survivor. More important than her family. She was carrying the water for her family. Maybe she was going to sell it. More important than her job. She left the thing and went into the town. No wonder a revival was caused by that one woman. And Jesus Christ was satisfied. He was filled. The disciples came. Lord, we have brought food. He said, I'm okay. He said, ah. We thought you were hungry. He said, I have food to eat that you do not know of. I've just eaten. You see, the, the man loves relationship. He said, I've just eaten. I'm full. You can eat the food. I'll just eat it. Say, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish it. He met one woman who gave him worship, gave him relationship, gave him fellowship. And he said that they were talking about worship. He said, Our fathers worship on the mountain, but you say that we should worship in Jerusalem. He said, Believe me, woman, the time is coming. Where the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He said, you worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know because salvation is of the Jews. Do you know the salvation? The water that was that was in the well. Isaiah 12, 3. He said, with joy, you will draw waters from the wells of salvation. And the woman said, man, you don't have anything with which to draw the water. He said, you don't know. Once I get joy, I can draw the waters out of the wells of salvation. That is why anytime you enter, you satisfy God's demand for intimacy, joy is released. Because it is joy that he uses to draw water from the wells. And that joy becomes your strength. Now the Lord says that the sixth hour is a sixth man. And he has come to the world again. This is something prophetic for the entire church. Something is about to happen. Why? Because Jesus has come to the world again. And he's waiting for people who go on their knees and give him food to eat. When God is satisfied, that's where he breathes out revelation. That's where he breathes out power. When God is satisfied, that is where he meets needs. When God had eaten, he said, where is Sarah thy wife? Abraham had fed God. He had given God something to eat and God was satisfied. God said, ah, where is Sarah your wife? And yet by this time, I will come again and your wife Sarah will, will, will bear a child. Abraham didn't tell God about his needs. He only served God food. He gave God food. Prepared butter and cheese and milk and all. He knew how to entertain God. And when God was satisfied, because God saw that this man, I have everything. He has given me everything. You know something? He was waiting while God and two angels were eating. Abraham was standing by. That is a waiter. That's it. That's, he, said, he was waiting for them to eat. He was standing there. That's the waiter. He said, so if they need salt, he said, uh, we, we give us salt. You go and bring salt. Uh, give us pepper. You go and, that's a waiter. Those who wait on the Lord, they shall renew their strength. When you wait on God, you the joy of God is really, and the joy of God is your strength. Hallelujah. So this six month is a month of intimacy. It's a month of visitation. It came to pass uh, in, in the sixth month, an angel was sent to a virgin named Mary. He said, at the sixth hour, I went to the world. And what am I looking for? I'm looking for relationship and fellowship. And this is the time. 
You determine your level of intimacy with God, not God. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. He said, draw nigh to me and I will draw nigh to you. You draw nigh. He said, draw nigh to me. This man, if you can decide that I'm going to pursue a relationship with God, I'm going to pursue a life of intimacy. I'm going to forget about all my needs. I'm going to forget about all that I'm craving for and just seek after God. I'm telling you, God will visit you. Because he is at the well. He is at the well again, waiting for somebody who is prepared to leave his water pot. Why not us? Why not now? Why can't it be us? Why can't it be us? Why can't we be the people who give God, who will come to the world to meet him at the sixth hour? That's why I'm bringing this message because it is for us. This is a month of intimacy. That's why it's a month of prophetic. Because Prophetic simply is intimacy. The very first time the word prophet was used in the Bible was the first time the word prayer was used in the Bible. He said, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you. No prayer, no prophetic. Don't say you are a prophet if you are not prayerful. You can be a prophet. You may have a gift. You may have a gift that you can minister to people But you stand before God as a prophet. When you spend time with God, when you you are in intimate relationship with God, that's when you become God's friend. He said, he will reveal his secrets to his friends. The key to revelation is intimacy. We are going to pray. If you can abandon everything, if you can abandon everything, if you can say that I leave everything. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to act as if I don't, I, I don't think about anything else. I just want you. If I can only get you, if I can only get to know you, if you see, sometimes God so loves the relationship that sometimes, you know what happened to Paul? Paul was busy preaching, healing the sick. God drove him to prison. He was in prison that Paul was saying that I may know him, that I may know he was in prison. Philippians, he was in prison that I may know him. <laughs> he was in prison. He was out of you see. So I love the prison books. The books that Paul wrote when he was in prison. There is a certain tone that you, when you read, you say, ah, because that was a place where he was he was. At it again, crying after God, and he had gotten to the last, the last lap of his ministry. But you say that I may know Him, which means there's no limit to how much of God, how we can know God. There's no limit. But you can decide that today, I want God to be my pursuit. I want God to be my pursuit. I want to come to a place where I, you will touch me. A place where I'm in love with you. That is Christianity. You see, because we have neglected the first commandment, that's where we can't follow his commandments. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. The first commandment is to love God. When you pursue intimacy, if you love me, it will be easy to keep my commandments. He was not saying that you prove your love for me by keeping my commandments. No. He said, if only you can love me, if only you can decide to follow God, to pursue it, mercy. I'm telling you, that thing you are struggling with, it will be broken. You wouldn't need to struggle. If only you can pursue a relationship with God, it, it will be broken. If you love me, you will keep it. Let's bow our heads. I want us to pray. Oh, somebody will say, so how do I pursue this relationship? Don't worry, I'm going to spend the whole month of May talking about intimacy so you understand. How do I you open your mouth and tell God. You tell God I want you to take me to a place of intimacy. 
Take me to the Holy of Holies. Take me to deeper levels of intimacy. I'm tired of the shadows, shallow waters. I want to go deeper in you. I want to know you. I want you to be my utmost obsession. I want you to be my be all and end all. Everything, everything. I surrender everything to you. When God hears that prayer, I tell you, God will answer that prayer with the spirit of light. When God hears a cry, he will come speedily. When he hears somebody crying out, for he says, the thirsty shall be filled. God desires to fulfill our hunger, to, fit, to, to satisfy our thirst. When you cry out, when Hagar cried out, Bible says, and the Lord God heard the voice of the Lord, Ishmael, crying out because he was thirsty and God came on the scene. Tell God, I need you. I want you. I want you. I want to be your friend. I want to come to a place of intimacy where nothing comes between you and I. I want us to be lovers again. Lovers again. Lovers, not dry, cold religion, but lovers. A love relationship. A relationship of love. Where he can touch you. Where he can move you. Where there's a personal touch. The reason why Jesus was so attracted to Mary was because Mary pursued intimacy. She was addicted to the feet. She fell at the feet of Jesus. She sat at the feet of Jesus. She wiped her hair with, with, uh, with the, the feet of Jesus with her hair. Because it was a place of intimacy. Oh, thank you, Lord. Open your mouth and tell him, I need you every day. I need you. I need you. I need you in my life. I need you. Put me on this path of intimacy. Put me on this path of intimacy. Put me on this path, on this road of intimacy. You can't get it wrong in intimacy. You can't fail when you are intimate with God. You can't get it wrong. You can get it wrong pursuing gifts. You can get it wrong pursuing the things of God. You can get it wrong even, even by doing ministry. But you can't get it wrong in intimacy. You can't get it wrong. He said, David, a man after my own heart. A man who is looking for my heart, not my hands. That is why God also lifted David. That's why God also said, I found my servant David with my holy oil. I've anointed him because he's a man after my heart. Somebody who is seeking the heart of God, who is saying, I want to know you more. I surrender to you, all to you. I give all to you. I give all to you. I surrender all to you. Nothing else is important. David said, whom am I in heaven but you? But you on earth has designed nothing but you. He said, I will serve no foreign God, nor any other treasure. You are my heart desire. You are my heart desire. From today, I make you my focus. I make you the center of it all. I yield to you. I, 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 I open the door of my heart to you unreservedly. I, I will not have you stand at my door, at, at my door and knock. I open the door to you. He said, whoever opens to me, I will come in and I will die with you. I will come in and I will die with you. I need you. Oh, I every I need you. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. If you are, I can do you. Oh, I need you. Oh, I need you. Oh, I I come to 
on Christ the soul. The rock I stand all on the ground is sinking sand. All on the ground is sinking sand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Son, lean rock I stand, Oh, the crown is sinking sad. Oh, the crown is sinking sad. You make my life so beautiful. And as you are you have made me here on earth. nothing greater than you. That's why I love you forevermore. You make my life so beautiful. And as you are, you have made me here on earth. There's nothing greater than thee. That's why I love you forevermore. I want more of you I want more of you Jesus the more I know you the more I want to know you Jesus more of you I want more of you, Jesus. I want more of you, Jesus. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus. More of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, Jesus, more of you, more of you, more of you. More of you, Jesus, more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, Jesus, more of you, more of you. More of you, more of you, Jesus, more, oh, more of you, more of you, more of you, 
Jesus Lord, I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the pain I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. For there is no greater calling than to bow and kneel before your throne. I'm amazed at your glory embraced by your mercy, O oh Lord. I live to worship you. There is no higher calling, no greater honor than to bow and kneel before your throne. I'm amazed at your glory and praise by your mercy, O oh Lord. I need to worship you, to worship you, I live, to worship you, I live, to worship you, I live, I live, to worship you, oh, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live. To worship you. I want you to tell him that I want to go back to my first love. I want to go back to a place of intimacy. I want to go back to a place, the place where you first found me. I want to go back to the place where we met. The place where your love caught me. The place where I fell in love with you. I want to be passionate about you one more time. I want to be crazy for you one more time. I want to be turned on by your, na by your name one more time. I want to have that touch one more time. I want to have that touch one more time. Take me to the place of intimacy. Take me to the king's chamber. Take me to the place of intimacy. Oh, open your mouth and begin to talk to God. Tell him, God, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming back to the place of intimacy. I'm coming back to the place of worship where I lay everything down. I come to the place where I lay everything down. I'm coming to the, back to the place where you become my utmost obsession. Where you become my everything. Where you become my number one. I'm tired of living in the shadows. I'm tired of living in the shadows. I'm coming into the light. I'm tired of dwelling in shallow waters. Shallow waters. I Take me to the deep. Take me to the deep. Take me to the deep. Take me to the deep places. 
Take me to the deep places. Take me to the deep places. Take me to the deep places. Koriyan na basikaharam. Libro to roboho sihada. Koriyan na nabam. Lobro to sihan talabam. Koriyan talabam. Koriyan talabam. Priest will sing your praise. I hang out and thirst of the righteousness and it is only found in one place. Take me to the holy of holies. Take me by the blood of the Lamb. Take me to the holy of holy. Take the cold, touch my lips, here I am. Take me to the holy of holy. Oh, take me by the blood of the land take me to the holy of holy take the cold that's why here I am oh we pray for grace we pray for grace just go come boldly to the throne of grace and receive grace Grace to abide. Grace for intimacy. Grace to pursue him. Relentless pursuit. Grace to go after him. Grace to go after his heart. Grace to develop relationship. Grace to go after his heart. Go after his heart. It's a love work. It's a love work. It's a love work. It's not religion. It's not church. It's not church. It's a love work. It's a, it's a work with your lover. What was the last time he whispered into your ears? What was the last time you whispered into his ears? What was the last time you were in his presence, in his embrace, just speaking to him, just speaking to him, just loving on him, just loving on him? That's the place of intimacy. That's the place where true ministry is birthed. That's the place where power is released. That's the place of strength. That's our stronghold. Our stronghold. When you are feasting with your father on the table, that's a place the enemy cannot come to. He sets a table before you in the presence of your enemies. It's a place of intimacy and fellowship. That's a place of strength. That's the stronghold of the believer. Our stronghold is intimacy. Our stronghold is our first love. Oh, take us back to our first love. Rekindle our first love. Rekindle us, O oh God. Help us to go back to the first love. We remember when we first believed. We remember when we fell in love with you. We remember when we fell in love with you. We remember how we were yearning for your presence. How we were yearning for you, O oh God. How we were willing to risk anything just to be in your presence. How we were willing, O oh God, to spend time with you. How we were willing to set the scripture, not just to read, but to encounter you. How we were willing to pray, not just to, not just to take take against our name, but to encounter your presence. We remember how God, we spent hours and hours and hours just trying to say we love you. We came into your presence, not to receive your presence, but to receive your presence, to enjoy your presence, not to receive your giftings, but to have you to ourselves, to have time between you and us. Take us back to that place, oh God. Oh, take us back to that place. Take us back to that place. Take us back to that place, oh God. Take us back to that place. We have come to a place where reading the Bible has become a religious duty. We call it quiet time. But God wants to have uh, 20, you 24-7. He wants to have your mind and your heart. He wants to have your subconsciousness and your consciousness. He wants to have you 24-7. We've limited God to just some few hours in the day we call quiet time. God wants to take us to a place where if you don't read the, the word of God, you, you don't feel guilty, you feel hungry. You feel hungry. You, you, you are looking for something from him. You really want to know him. You want to know him and surrender your all to him. 
Let this man be a man where you pursue God for the rest of your life. Let today be the day that the vows were renewed. Let's go back to our vows. Renew our vows again. When we first exchanged the vow, we said we take him to be our Lord. We said we will love him forever. We said we will be all for him. We said we are, we forsake all and cling to him. But today, now, 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 now we have more, many other sources. We have many other things that give us joy. We have many other things that bring pleasure. But he wants to be the sole source, the single source of our joy and our pleasure. He wants to be the one in all, number one in our hearts, the first place. God was the first place, the best part of our life. God is tired, tired being relegated to the background, tired of being second, tired of playing second fiddle. He wants to be the number one who is living in the upper room of your house. Who is residing in the upper room of your house? What room are you making for God in your life? What room are you making for God in our lives? We renew our vows today. We renew our vows this, this day. And we say, Lord, we are coming to a place of intimacy. We are coming to your table. We are, we are, we are taking this communion. As a symbol that we are renewing our vows today. We are renewing our wedding vows today. We are saying that Lord I'm coming for you. I'm coming after you. I'm coming after your heart. I'm coming after your heart. I'm pursuing your heart. I'm pursuing intimacy. That is the missing link. The missing link is a life of intimacy. A life of intimacy. The whole essence of the Christian journey is love, not doctrines. It's love. Paul said, the goal of our instruction is love. Love is the whole thing. That is love. Our love relationship. When that one is growing and intact, every other relationship will find meaning. The reason why we are faltering in our relationships, the reason why we, we are suffering in our lives, it's because we have neglected our place of love. We have neglected our first love. He said, come back to me. I'm your first love. I first love you. Come back to me. Let's begin again. Father, we thank you. We bless your name. We give you praise. Take us to a place, oh God. A place of intimacy. Help us, Lord. Give us praise. You call we want to come up here. We want to come up with God. We want to come up to a place of friendship. We want to come out to a place of intimacy. We want to come out to a place of God where we yearn for you. All our bodies are yearning for you. Our spirits are flowing. Touch us one more time, oh God. Touch us and bring us to a place where our spirits are groaning. A place where our spirits are groaning for greater intimacy. Deep is calling on to deep. The Father, we want to dwell in your presence and behold the face of the King. That we will never want to leave your house. He said, goodness and mercy shall flow us. That we will dwell in the house forever, forever. A place where it doesn't matter the goodness and the mercy that follows us we will dwell in your house forever. A place where you Make us a pillar in the house of your God and your Father. 